Very good morning to you all and welcome to The Key Points with me, Abna Tabi. It is the 15th day of June 2019 and another weekend is here with us. We are back here to look at major issues that made the headlines during the week. As usual, we're coming to you live from the studios of TV3 here in Accra. We're also live on 3FM 92.7 and streaming live at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. The show runs from now till 9.50, and by 9.50, we'd have done some serious analysis of the topics we've lined up for today's conversation. We encourage you, as usual, to send through your comments, your contributions, whatever it is you have in respect of the topics I'll be outlining very soon to our WhatsApp number, 020-2166633. And we will read them out as we go along on the show. <clears throat> Today on the show, we shall be looking at some key findings of the University of Ghana Political Science Department study on the performance of M keys. Now, the findings of the study were presented on Monday, the 10th of June 2019, and it appears the MPs are not particularly enthused by the research and its findings. Some of them have actually described the research and its findings as, quote, bogus and not scientifically inclusive of all official and unofficial duties of MPs. We shall be looking into detail the research by the Department of Political Science of the University of Ghana, which reveals, among others, that over 180 non-performing MPs who are mostly first-timers will be voted out in the 2020 general elections and of course other matters arising in respect of this issue. Then we shall turn our attention to the arrest of the national chairman of the NDC, Mr. Samuel Ofosu Ampofo. Now according to the Ghana Police Service, its um, department, the Criminal Investigations Department, is investigating, quote, is investigating various acts of kidnapping and causing unlawful damage in which credible and actionable intelligence makes Mr. Samuel Ofosuampofo a suspect. Now, you will recall that not too long ago, Mr. Samuel Ofosuampofo declined the CID's invitation to assist with investigations into some cases of kidnapping. Well, Mr. Ofosuampofo, following his refusal to attend to the CID's invitation, was arrested by the police in the afternoon of Tuesday, 11 June 2019, pass 2 an arrest warrant. Now he was sent to his house thereafter and a search was conducted pursuant to a search warrant. He was released the same day on police inquiry bail and it is reported that Mr. Ufuswampofo and his lawyers appear to be cooperating with the police. And we're told that he's to report back to the police on Wednesday the 19th of June 2019. Now curious minds are inquiring whether what we are seeing is um, a manifestation of the rule of law at play or political persecution as suggested by the NDC. Now, we shall be looking at the arrest of the NDC national chairman and matters arising on the show this morning. Then lastly, we'll turn our attention to the rescuing of the two Canadian women who were allegedly kidnapped. Now, in a collaborative effort by the security services of Ghana, the two Canadian girls who were allegedly kidnapped were rescued on Wednesday, 12th of June, 2019. So far, about 11 persons have been arrested in connection with this incident. Now, the young ladies are reported to have been volunteering with an NGO Youth Challenge International when they were kidnapped. Eight of the arrested persons who arrested persons on Wednesday were arraigned before court on Friday, the 14th of June, on charges of kidnapping. Now, the operation to rescue the girls, we're told, took less than half an hour. That's according to the Minister of Information. Now, today on the show, we'll be looking at the many, many, many issues that have come up subsequent to the rescuing of the two Canadian ladies. Of course, key among them is a question regarding our Takradi girls and what are the chances of us finding them as well. So, these are the topics we've outlined for, excuse me, today's conversation. We'll take a break. When we come back, I'll introduce to you the panelists for today's conversation. As usual, this promises to be exciting and stimulating. Do stick with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So I'll quickly introduce the panelists for today's conversations. <coughs> From my extreme left, we have Alex Ketri Duku Frempong. He is the senior lecturer at the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana and a member of the team that undertook the study uh, in respect of AMPs, which we'll be discussing this morning. Next to him is Brigadier General Nunu Mensa. He is a former Chief of Defense Staff. And to my right, we have Andrew Ejapa Mesa. He is the Honorable MP for second D constituency and he's also a legal practitioner and last but not least we have dr clement apak he is also the honorable mp for bolsa south constituency good morning gentlemen good morning. Good morning and welcome to the show it's good to have you <coughs> sure. so our first issue we'll be looking at would be uh, the study conducted by the uh, political science department into the performance of MPs. Now we'll take a listen to um, one of the researchers, Dr. Isaac Olsu Mensa, <laughs> at the um, presentation of the report earlier on in the week on Monday. And then we'll take a reaction from Parliament and then we return to the panelists in the studio. So quickly let's take a listen to Dr. Isaac Olsu Mensa and how Parliament reacted to the findings of this report. MP is supposed to be an advocate for development. Nationally, 50.8, more than half of Ghanaians are telling us that MP, your role is to what? Develop. You are advocate of development. That is the role of member of parliament. Last week, there was a program organized by the Carlos Bishop and the first deputy speaker was telling us his experience of going to his constituents, whereby he met the people and discussed issues about parliament with them. They were not interested. They were interested in the school classroom when you are building it. I'm told that you need a lot of money to be able to visit their constituencies. But the truth is, whether you like it or not, members of parliament, we expect you in the constituency. Now, we have information in some electoral areas and some constituencies that since some members of parliament were voted for, they have not done what we call test you tour. Going back to say thank you people for voting for me to serve you, some members of parliament are yet to do that. The poll published on Monday stated over 186 MPs are likely to lose their seats. The survey had 42.6% of the respondents ready to retain their lawmakers with 7.9% of the respondents still undecided. Majority of the respondents representing 46.7% do not want their incumbent MPs to contest in 2020 general elections while 42.4% want their MPs to contest, with 10.9% still undecided on whether their MPs should contest or not. An enraged first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joel Sewusu, wants the researchers dragged before the House for further explanations. I think it is incumbent upon us to assist them to be able to do it in a manner which will reflect the true, the, the true role uh, of, of a member of Parliament. In this circumstances, speaker, I wish to uh, recommend that the group that is involved in the research be invited to meet with a group here to discuss with them what are the constitutional rules, what are the others, and then agree on modalities and the parameters. Minority leader Harun Idrisu says the report is just only targeting MPs to make them unpopular. This is a threat to our survival, and this pronouncement will amount to declaring all of us as we have been declared as non performing MPs, even though I admit that there is a role conflict and there is confusion every other day as to the role of an MP. But, Mr. Speaker, that confusion should not emanate from a university when ordinary members of the public who probably are uneducated or not better educated come to those assumptions and conclusions, they can be forgiven. But to come from academia is even more worrying, and therefore I support the first deputy speaker that we get a committee to engage them, to appreciate the basis of the work that they have done. We will explain our part to enrich, to enrich the work they do. 
on the workings of Parliament are spelt out in the Constitution. Speaker Professor Michael Quay is less enthused about the report. No road, no vote is not part of the MP's work. Honorable members of Parliament are not voted any sums of money to construct roads. I plead that we should understand these things because honorable members of parliament are representatives of the people so elected to be touting that they are going to leave the house en masse because of what somebody else is saying is not fair to the institution of parliament or to the people's own representative power. In fact, it might tantamount to incitement and it is not fair. Yes, so that was um, a piece of what happened at the uh, presentation of the report on Monday, and then you heard the reaction from Parliament. Um, Mr. Kedri from Paul, yeah. once again, your research findings have stirred up lots of sentiments. You've heard the reaction from Parliament. We'll go into that, but just you know, tell us about your study. We do know that the methodology, in terms of methodology, you interviewed 100 persons in yeah, per constituency. So in all, you had about 27,500 respondents, and you came up with these findings. Um, the parliamentarians have raised issues with the findings. Key amongst them has to do with the fact that they're saying, well, your findings do not take into consideration you know, several aspects of your roles. It seems you focused heavily on the presence <coughs> of MPs in their constituencies and you know how active they are in terms of development work in their area. What do you have to say to that? All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And let me make one or two clarifications. Okay. In the first place, this is not a, a Department of Political Science projects. Some members, with the support of the Conor Adam Foundation, are making this. So it is not a whole so department. Not, right. There have been times in 2000 and so on where we had a departmental project. But this is not. This is not one of the departments. Yes, this is okay. just a team Very well. within the department. Uh, I'm making this point because other faculty members who are not involved do not feel comfortable. The next important point I want to make is that we are very much aware of the other functions of the MP, particularly in Parliament. They are to make laws, they are to deliberate on national issues, they have to approve the budget and control the finance, they have oversight rules as mm -hmm. well. Okay. And these they perform at both the committee and plenary levels. I will even add that Parliament now even had international functions in ECOWAS and African Parliament and so on. But I'm also sure that nobody would de deny that as representatives of the people, MPs have consistency services okay. as well. And on the basis of that, I'm saying that our research was focused on MPs' consistency services. What the voters say about the consistency functions of and the if I may MP. ask before you go on, what, what um, informed the decision to stick to that particular aspect of the MP's role? You remember, is it with Dick Rose, uh, some other mm -hmm. body had mm -hmm. dealt with the functions of MP in Parliament. You also remember that dealing with 275, we could not cover all. And it's normal for any research to have a particular focus. You remember since 2016, from time to time we have been conducting some of this research. The 2016 was focused on the election itself. We have done uh, one year of a Kufuado and two years of a Kufuado. But we thought nothing has been done on Parliament at all. But it was going to be difficult for us to, with the resources we have, to cover all the other aspects. So we felt 
the people who put the MPs there, can we ask about their perceptions? How far they think their MPs are working? And we had hoped that the responses, given that it's about a midterm, will give our honorable members some opportunity to see what they can do in the rest of the term to improve their circumstances. But to the extent that it focuses only on one aspect, which of course the um, um, and par parliamentarians have come out to categorically say that, well, indeed, that is not even part of their constitutional mandate. And so for a research to focus on that, they find it quite problematic. Are, are they saying that MPs do not have constituency services? I'm not sure. Mm. We think, like I've tried to explain, the work in parliament, both preliminary and committee level, committee level, the international functions are all important part of their job. But as representatives, we believe very well that they have some consistency functions to bear for. Mm. No, and no. given our resources, we decided to focus on that. Okay, so in fact, let me, let me just say this. First of all, I commend the team for this work done because this is what we expect you know academia to be doing put out such findings and also first of all that must be put out i i really commend the work done but in as much as we commend it too, we need to also you know take into consideration the concerns that are coming up we are very much working exactly. we are very much working. sure and that's why yeah we are asking um, all these questions um in terms of the resources i mean there are those who are saying that okay so to the extent that you're able to cover all 275 constituencies. Mm -hmm. You had 100 respondents. Yes. There was an opportunity for you to have, if you like, you know, in terms of the questionnaire that you were using, put in some elements that would reflect, you know, the, 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 the holistic role of the MPs, which would necessarily <coughs> include legislation, representation, and what have you. So if you could explain how the lack of resources limited you in this regard. I've already explained that when you are going out to do research, you may have a particular focus. Mm. And in this case, we felt that, if not for anything, uh, with the crew, they had done yeah, the parliamentary six. part. Mm. So if we do this other part, maybe another group will do the international. Or there could be resources for all of us to do a holistic one. So in doing this, we didn't, in fact, initially, the initial questions we asked, a few people included the fact that MPs have legislative functions and so on. But we really wanted to see what the people feel about what they are doing for them in their constituencies. Right. So quickly before I move to the parliamentarians who are seated on my right here, <laughs> who are ready to speak. <laughs> Great question. You know, I'm looking at some of your questions. Do you want incumbent NDC MP to contest again in 2020? Do you want incumbent MPP? So, so there's a general there's, question. What are the sub-questions, for instance? You just give there, us an idea. There's, there's Questions you have mentioned came later. Okay. Issues about assessment came later. Right. After we have asked those specific questions about what they think the IMPs are doing, okay. level of interaction, whether IMPs have a consistent uh, office where people can interact. That, right. for example, was important for us because if you are MPP, MP, and your office is at the MPP office, uh, uh, consistency office, if people see me and NDC man going there, there will be problems. So we expect that MPs have some, well, which is the MPs con uh, office for all the constituents. Mm. And whatever your political uh, dispensation, you could go there and talk to him. Mm. So that, for example, is the basis why we will be asking questions about the office of the MP. How often he gets there? Are people able to? have opportunities to interact with him. Mm -hmm. Are they happy with the interaction and things like that? We did all that. Even, we even went on to talk about even their relations with other opinion leaders, yes. like the chiefs, like the M MMDCs, and like assemblymen. We did all those things. We also had asked about 
whether MPs have made promises, because it's often comes MPs don't build roads, sure. things and that. So we actually talked about those things. And, and in respect to that question, it's interesting, the findings, about 88.7%. Exactly. That, that was the point I was going to make. Yeah. That 88.7% said their MPs made, made promises. promises at a uh, dissemination workshop. It came out that the MPs who were there were trying to say that those promises they made were not for them personally, but it was what were in their uh, party I'm manifestos, hoping that if their parties came to power, they would be doing those things. Mm. And the point we were making was that, are they sure they communicated it in exact terms to, to the constituents? And if they did not, then I don't think we should be blamed when their own communication didn't so, so. By the first time I hear MP's promises are in the context of, of manifesto, manifesto yeah. was at the conference. Right. So those other issues that you are raising came later. Mm. So the issue about assessment, for example, after you have looked at all these things that we have asked you, how do you assess your MP? Excellent, very good, okay. or very bad. Okay. So that one was there. Then we also asked them, uh, if you are marking them by 100%, how, how, what do you give? And whatever figure we had was for the 100 within that consistency. And if I may even touch on, a little on the uh, methodology. We, we went for all the 275. Five electoral areas selected ran at random. We we'll pick from the hat. Okay. Then, in fact, there are two or so so how are these electoral areas spread in terms of, you know, looking at every, nationally every how, one, how so well distributed were they? 275 times 3, except that there are two in Accra which has less than 5. Okay. But all electoral areas which are more than 5, we pick those 5 okay. uh, randomly. Mm. Then when we, uh, you went to any of the electoral areas, we said, they should interview uh, the first person and every fifth household to try to spread this as much as yeah. possible. Like all research, there will be problems. Sure. I'm sure if we had, we had asked for a thousand people, maybe the results we had. And that is why we have declared our methodology. Mm. In terms of demographic and all that, the figures balance. Majority, for example, are within 18 to 40, okay. while the uh, older people are lower. Education is cut across all. Mm -hmm. Even people who have not been to uh, school before. At the dissemination workshop, YMP said we should have interviewed enlightened people. And we were wondering why, because when it comes to votes, yeah, it's for it's everybody. everybody. <laughs> Very well. And fortunately, all the uh, all the demographics as representative, religion and everything, we put I all those things into the Very well, that's, that's fine. Now, let me turn to um, Dr. Pak here. Um, oh, Parliament yes. has reacted in a way that clearly suggests that <coughs> uh, they are not, you know, enthused with or by these findings. And the reasons raised the fact that, yes, there's an over-concentration on the MP and what they do or what he does at the constituency level and all of that. And in the findings, you know, I talked about the 88.7% of people who said that, yes, MPs made promises. Question then, I mean, we can't run away from the fact that, indeed, MPs run their campaigns on what they are going to do for the constituencies. I mean, to the extent that you would say, I would, when, if I come, I would do this, I would do that. So, so what exactly is the concern by parliamentarians that this research seems to have focused on, if you like, something out of their constitutional mandate? Very well, Abna, let me say good morning uh, to you. Good morning to good morning. <coughs> senior panelists <laughs> and uh, <laughs> junior panelists. 
<laughs> we are colleagues in Parliament, but mm -hmm. of course, yeah, he knows yes. that I entered the Great Commonwealth a year before he did, <laughs> and he understands oh, that he very well. It is, it is. You know, we have a very Point well defined hierarchy okay. and as far as the great commonwealth hall is concerned yeah. and we recognize that yes. he knows that oh he's also a senior yeah, man yeah. now very yeah. well I like so, it, it too. oh okay <laughs> then in that case i think i, I will have to reduce <laughs> my, <laughs> my my temptation right. to <laughs> to talk about my profile in <laughs> commonwealth yes <laughs> but but um, let me also greet the people of Bursa south because i know they watch uh, mm -hmm. tv3 and uh, to say of the bat that uh, having been somebody who was drawn from academia myself, mm -hmm. uh, I understand research. Uh, research must always be appreciated. I think where usually there are differences is uh, the interpretation of the, the outcome and how it affects the uh, el different elements whose interests the research seeks to, to look at. So we were just conferring here, and we are not dismissing the research. Sure. But as uh, our leadership... And in, it's for in, what it worth, it triggers a certain absolutely. conversation. Yes. So. We, we, we accept that. I yeah. mean, if for nothing at all, it's a wake up call. Yep. Uh, but I think the uh, basis for the concerns that were raised by leadership in Parliament, uh, led by the first uh, Deputy Speaker, himself an old vandal, uh, the Honorable Joe Sewusu, uh, and indeed leader. supported himself. by the yeah. minority leader, also a, an old vandal, and also anchored by the, the, the Speaker of Parliament, not That's an old vandal, vandal, but okay. Just checking. A, a retired senior member mm. of uh, the University of Ghana, whom I am told the taught okay. the, the lead researcher. Right. You see, it, 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 mm. it is because we, 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 we also felt that there are certain parameters that we would have thought would be considered uh, in the formulation of the research and perhaps even informing the research question. Because Prof would agree with me that you don't just go and do research. You must sit down, you must think about what you are going to do. You have to identify the topic and identify a research uh, uh, topic around which you don't formulate your research questions. Now, how you go about disseminating that questionnaire is a whole different matter. Uh, I don't know how Prof and his team recruited the field agents to administer the questionnaire. Whether these were agents selected randomly, whether the agents themselves were selected according to the particular constituencies that, you know, the work was being done, their educational background, perhaps even their political interests mm. and motivation. Mm. All of these are factors that only the researchers perhaps will be able to inform us. But you see, I am happy that Prof himself indicated that the team recognizes the core functions of a member of parliament. And I think that is very important. First, to make laws, to have oversight responsibility over the executive, and to represent our constituents. And that can come in a variety of ways advocating for them, lobbying for improvement mm -hmm. in, their, in, the, in, 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 in their conditions of life. That is where the roads and electricity and the schools and the furniture and the computers, and even sometimes even get, try to help some of your constituents get employment. But it seems the lobbying for in. development is what has led to this. No, no, I, I'm, I'm I coming yes, to that. Th there's now but the you sense see, that I will but, but do you it. See, but you see, that is a product of how we misunderstand the role of MPs, and I think it is also a consequence of our infant democracy. It is also a product. Infant democracy, or what that MPs have for some time. No, so I'm not, you are not getting the source I, of my I, input. What I am I saying do. is that when you represent people like the people that I represent, a very rural constituency where almost every amenity is in short supply or insufficient or doesn't exist. Naturally, the expectations are high. Mm -hmm. And it is not that MPs promise. Yeah, so if the expectations are high but, and you go but, promising, no, what no, no. Is it is not that MPs promise. I can speak, I can speak for myself. And made. it is good that we are here because this is a live theater. Mm. So that Prof will also hear from us directly <laughs> sure. some of the challenges that sure. we face. 
For example, I never promised anything, but I did you indicate to my constituents that I would lobby. <laughs> I would lobby, yeah. knowing fully well that the MP doesn't have the capacity to construct a road, for example. But I can lobby for a road to be constructed. I can lobby to get get fund to provide furniture to some schools in my constituency. Okay, so let, just a minute. So in you terms of the point. lobbying, which which is really and truly a constitutional mandate of MP. That is it. Now, if people or your constituents are assessing you by these developmental projects, is it wrong? Even if you didn't promise them, indeed, really and truly, it is your constitutional mandate. That's correct. And so we are saying that for the past maybe two terms that you've been in Parliament, well, we don't see these kinds of projects in areas, so then you're not doing well. So on that, then, on that basis, yes. there is a, there's a good some then, basis then, for that assessment, then it becomes, then you may not have Then it becomes your responsibility to let your constituents know exactly. what the challenges are and okay. why what you told them, you <coughs> lobby for them. You are not being able to, to do. So that is very important. And that is why we are saying that this is not to be dismissed. But we have serious questions. I mean, Prof, for example, uh, spoke about engaging 20 people from at least uh, five uh, electoral areas. Yes. How were they selected? I mean, we politicians will tell you that every, was it random? Was it targeted? Oh, every, every politician will tell you that randomly. you have your enclaves where you are strong. And there are certain enclaves, even if you were to build or construct a road made of gold, you certainly will not get good grade. Then. So how were they selected? Yeah. How were they well, he Placed. said they were randomly selected. That is the point. Randomly selected according to what criteria? Ah. <laughs> I told you we put the list of all the electoral consistent and uh, electoral areas in each consistency. Uh, in in the heart. Uh, we shook it. And then yes. so there's a tendency that he may not be representative. No. Ah, well, but they would have done but what, what they and this is only fine. No. You take take my, my constituency for example. I have fifty four branches. I didn't win in all of them. But perhaps, if it was consciously done and balanced, where you, you perhaps consulted us, or that is where I think leadership comes in, to get our input, we could have input told you. Input for assessing you. Yes. Input for assessing you. Yeah, but was it fair to go and assess me at enclaves where my opponents are dominant? I mean, these are legitimate questions to ask the researcher. I'm not saying that what he has done is wrong, but mm -hmm. we also must point out some but of the did, challenges. Yeah. And then he spoke about the thank you talk. Maybe it's not mandatory that you must, you know, embark on a thank you tour. Although I did, I know the people of Bootsa South are watching. Mm. I have 54 branches. I went to 52. The only reason why I didn't go to the other two was because at the time, those communities were grieving. They were funerals. And in my custom and tradition, you don't yeah. go engaging in that type of activity when the communities are mourning the dead. So, so I, for people, example, assuming they, those people were interviewed, definitely they'll say you didn't come back for thank you. Yes, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I didn't. And I'm sure even where some people were interviewed, by virtue of not being my loyalist or not agreeing with me or having voted against me, because I didn't win 100%, they would have said that I'm not doing well. They, they may even say I never came for a thank you tour when it's on, on record that I did. So the point we are making is that, yes, research is good, it informs us on, on, the, on the way forward how to address our weaknesses, uh, perhaps how to reassure our constituents, and also to look at the promises that you made. Uh, we made uh, to them on the basis of getting their vote. But all of this, in as far as Prof's uh, research is concerned, is at variance, in direct opposition to what Odiko has been doing. Remember that just a few days ago, there was a story carried by your own network where certain MPs, quote-unquote, tick or are on the uh, votes and proceedings to be present, and yet they are not. Mm. And Parliament has rules. He knows if you are going to be absent from Parliament for more than three days, you must seek official permission from the Speaker. Mm. Now, if our constituents are saying they don't see us, how do you balance the two? Where you have to get permission to go to your constituency, and yet you are also expected to be 
in parliament and when you but miss it's, sitting it's, for 15 days no i mean i'm coming if you miss 15 days so without permission that, that, yeah. you automatically by the law if it is triggered you lose your seat so <laughs> i think that so you say in by all the of this of parliament you're constrained yes you, that is a fact you are constrained but when it comes to campaigning you're able to that is because there's a time for campaigning mm. <laughs> There are timelines, there are rules, and there are processes. A lot of people may not know this, but my colleague will tell you, if you absent yourself 15 times, yeah. you're out. You are out. And if you take my constituency, for example, Bootsa South, which is the furthest away from the national capital, I do well to go there at least yeah. once a month. So if I go, and the nature of my constituency, I'm at a place like Bachongsa, which is almost about 30 or so kilometers to the constituency capital. Fumisi, and you in Fumisi don't see me, then you assume that I don't come home, I don't interact. Okay. So these are some of the, the, the challenges that we face, that we thought, if perhaps some of these were factored in, it would have enriched the, the research. Yeah. Yeah. There's Very a well, lot yeah. more well. uh, to, to discuss, but right. I'll let, let my let colleague Let me come to you as um, 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 Mesa, for your, you know, what you make of all this. I mean, well, you heard um, the researcher, you've heard your colleague, parliamentarian. What do you make of it? Is it an over concentration on your activities in the constituency, or there's a certain misconception about you know what you're to do, or that parliamentarians have sold a certain narrative, and now the people are using that narrative to assess you, and it seems there's a certain level of discomfort with that. Well, I guess the presentation from uh, the researcher himself confirms that it was an over-concentration in the constituency. Mm -hmm. But that's appropriate. Let me just say good morning to my co-panelists and uh, to my very good friend and colleague, uh, Chief Park, <laughs> and to our church viewers, particularly those in my constituency, second day. It's important you greet them. Ne next, Otherwise, the next thing you know, you don't greet well, them. Well, <laughs> <myself. laughs> some, some people may draw those kinds of conclusions. <laughs> so, um, you see, I, I am a product of the political science department. And so, uh, even though, as has been admitted, mm -hmm. this was not a project of the department, uh, to the extent that faculty members sure. from the department have made <coughs> this research, mm. I cannot, for the life of me, rubbish the work of right. uh, people in academia, particularly from the department that I was trained from. Sure. But you see, I guess if the heading of the research had been performance of MPs in their constituencies, mm -hmm. wouldn't be having any debate whatsoever. Because, <coughs> like it or not, sentiments of people, no matter how representative or otherwise, that the survey may mm. be a sentiment of the people. But the conclusions that have been drawn is to say performance of MPs. Which makes it all inclusive. Absolutely. Uh. Is that what the research is about? And so it is legitimate for people to raise issues that, yes, nobody is faulting your research or your focus or your desire to, and as far as I know, Odi Crow does uh, attendance of MPs in Parliament. <laughs> they don't even go to committees to monitor what members of Parliament are doing there. And so that cannot be said to be that they focus on the performance of MPs. So in that parliament. Is, the Odi Crow yeah, web you're saying is not even is, is limited. holistic, right? Okay, and and so if leadership of parliament is saying that, look, have you seen the ranking that was given to the majority leader and <coughs> uh, minister for parliamentary even affairs? The second deputy speaker. The first deputy speaker, even the second deputy hmm. speaker. These are people who are elected to represent their people and have been given roles and functions that they are actively performing in parliament on a daily basis. And you rank them as non-performing. Those are the views of the people. Like I said, if that not was the, the heading mm -hmm. of the research, mm. but is it? It's not, but the substance of it, it is. It, is it? 
Is that what is being communicated out there? The perception of it is no, that see, the constituency is what is being communicated you. out there. I told you that our focus see, was on same the perception of the because this was uh -huh. same perception based on which this result, this research uh -huh. was conducted. What is the perception on the outcome uh -huh. that MPs are non performing, sweeping? Because the head in itself is not clear. I appreciate the head in You, you understand, but, but of I, course, I do get can, that. But it conveys in, a lot. But, 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 Honorable, you do appreciate also that when you go into it, the I've substance not, of it, I've so in terms disputed, of looking at no, I don't it. have a problem. Sure. I've not disputed mm. the content of the research. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the way it's been communicated, the way it's been put out there, makes the questions that people are asking legitimate. extremely legitimate. Mm. Okay, because for speaking for myself, my vehicle that I bought with the MP's loan that was issued by SGSSB. That's right. That I subscribed to. Of course, guaranteed by the state. Because they are my employers and they need to necessarily give the bank comfort uh -huh. that they would deduct my salary and pay uh -huh. the bank at the end of every month. Uh -huh. It's two years old. I've put 61,000 kilometers on it. My wife is from Escado, next door to my constituency. I'm from Second D. I don't have any family anywhere else apart from my siblings who live in Accra. Okay. I attend conferences every now and then in <coughs> Koforidua, maybe once in a while in Kumasi. I live at Trade Fair. My office is in a, a Usu Parliament. Will I put 60,000 kilometers on the vehicle in two years if I was going to Parliament and my home? So give or take, if I spend 20,000 in Accra, the 40,000 or 41,000, where does it go to? I go to my constituency. Okay, so yes. Um, I, I know that results of the research may not necessarily be an accurate representation of what people feel on the ground. But to the extent that the sample, okay, that was captured, indicates these kinds of feelings. I think it's useful feedback. And, and so we'll work with it to ensure that uh, where we have to improve, we do so. But the generalization of it as representing non-performing MPs, mm. I think, is, is, is not, is not uh, uh, appropriate at all. Very well. We need to take a break on this. When we come back, we'll take Brigadier General Nuno Mendes' um, perspective on this issue. But we'll be back shortly, and we'll have um, Mr. K. J. from Boris, you know, reactions to the comments that have come from the MPs in here. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We are live on TV3, also on 3FM 92.7, and at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we've been joined by Dr. Eric Odro Osai. He is a legal practitioner and also a governance expert. Good morning. Good morning. Doc, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Great. But before we go to Brigadier General Nuno Mensah for his perspective, let me quickly announce this that 3FM, in partnership with Serenity um, Beach Resort, is organizing a live band music and cocktail. And this is to celebrate Father's Day. Um, the venue is the Serenity Beach Resort, and the time is 12 noon. Date is Sunday, the 16th of June, 2019, which is tomorrow. So it's time to celebrate the unsigned heroes, talking about our fathers. So do make a date. Oh, yes, it is <laughs> at Serenity <laughs> Beach <laughs> Resort. Um, I need to find out about that. I wouldn't know. so. But I'll give that information out to you later. And you... I'm sure you It you're certainly cannot be in Fobisi, that much I know. It certainly cannot be what? <laughs> it can't be in Fobisi. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do that. So yes, um, let's go celebrate our fathers. And we're doing this um, 3FM in conjunction with Serenity Beach Resort. Great. So, Brigadier. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You've had the okay. discussions. Yes. Um, you know, the researchers have put their findings out there, yes. parliamentarians are raising issues, a whole lot of issues coming up. Yes. Why concentrate on our work 
in the constituencies. After all, that is not our constitutional mandate. Yes. It turns out, though, that most of the time, MPs campaign on what they're going to do in their constituencies. Yes. And it's based on that that, you know, they are elected. Yes. And so if the um, 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 constituents now are turning around to assess you by that yardstick, what is the, what is the big deal about? Thank you. There's a saying that if you want to understand somebody, you go and stand where he is standing, or she is standing, and look at things from his point of view. When we started our discussion, we said oh, we should be talking to some more enlightened people. And that's what some, some, some MPs, 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 yes. I agree. grew up among the, 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 the real fishermen, so I have the mentality of a fisherman. <laughs> so I understand. <laughs> If you know when you're back, you go to the mm, beach, that's where I came from. Mm. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so, I understand the mentality of those who are talking, right. for whom they talk to, because I'm coming from there. Education made me a bit enlightened, but I understand where they are coming from. I tried to go to Parliament in 1996, but I felt MPs were not performing. That's, my, that's me. Now, I'm not unenlightened. Not performing in terms of what? What is supposed to be? I, I, I will come to that. Sure. I'm coming to those, those issues. Because I think that's the point of contention. Yes, yes, what yes. is it that they are They think that their job is only to go and make laws. But there are many things that they're supposed to be doing to the perception of the people that they want to get their goods. They think it's God. The MP is God. It's everything. They look unto you to do everything for them. I'll give you an example. I was in Britain in the 80s. I had a problem. I was living in Croydon, in South London. I had a migration problem. My MP was the Speaker of House of Commons. He was in Parliament in London. I went to his office in, in, uh, in, in uh, Croydon. I met his staff. He took my concerns. And I was my MP. All I did see was the Minister of the Interior wrote to me a letter because my MP had spoken to him. Oh, that is the MP. He heard my concerns. He took it out with the, with, the, with the minister, the Home Secretary, and he wrote it, which I think I have it somewhere in my house right now. So the MP shouldn't just say that my job is to make law. You, you, are, you are like God to the, to the, to the, to the consequence. And it's like the military. When you are commanding a unit, your, your duty is, for the, for your, is, is, is to man, manage the 500 or 600 people under your command. But their families, their wives, their children, it extends to them. Because if the soldier is not performing well, because there's a problem with the family, it will affect his performance. So I want the MPs to understand that their jobs are not just to go and make laws. As far as the consumers are concerned, to them, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are everything. But, but, but being God to the constituents, does that mean that they, they go to them for their breakfast, lunch, supper, yeah. pay school yeah. fees, and all of that? Uh, uh, really? No, that. I'm, I'm coming to that. Yeah. Now, you, when you want votes, you go to them, come back for their votes. When you get their vote, you go to parliament. You don't see, some don't see you at all. When you can become in a vehicle with a, with a screen, windscreen, they don't see who is in a vehicle. I'm talking for experience. You, they don't see your faces. I had a governor, not a governor, a DC in the 50s. He had a car, but he will walk to his office. If you know South Campus in Winneban, in the village of okay, in the, at the beach, he lives somewhere there. And he will walk, he will walk from time to walk to his office. I saw him walking. He will talk to you, young man, how are you? He will engage with you. And you know, and that's what that's what's beautiful. So he gets to know his people. He gets to know his his constituency. You know, today I see my I've never seen my MP's face. I see uh, some blank are going, it's all dark and who's inside there. And he said you are in touch with your people. No, you are not in touch with them. And you know, and, and let me give you another example. In India, I was in India many years ago. It's a very high school. That means public servants and top politicians, we come I mean, we come together. Now, we wrote a paper on the performance of, of parliament and, and, and government. And we said in our report, and I very well, that when you become a member of parliament, you are coming from different backgrounds. They should be put together and schooled before they enter parliament what they are supposed to be doing in addition to their core duty of making laws. Because a lot you can do. Let me give another example. I was, when I was in, in charge of security under President Mills. My job was advising on security. But I don't know whether you heard what I've done with education, with building schools here, because I felt that I went to, I went to a village. The, 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 the chief wants something to do with doctor's bungalow. It wasn't my job. 
I would advise the, the president on security to talk about building bungalows or schools. I ended up doing all those things because they were demanding of the president to do it. So I'm saying here that what the report said, I, I can relate to the report it's, I can, entirely. Mm. I went to parliament. I tried to go. I didn't enter because I, I, mean, I, 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 I tried to. <laughs> but I wasn't clever enough to enter. <laughs> yeah, I was too honest. I mean, the military, you cannot lie your way. Look, if you go and tell soldiers there that I will do this for you, and you don't do it, you are in big, big trouble. That is what sometimes June 4th and this happened. So, see, don't take this job at being, at being um, it's a serious report. Mm. I think we should listen to it. Mm. Okay. That's what I would say about it. Very well. Yes. Let me quickly move on to um, Dr. Eric Odrosai. Yes. You're, 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 uh, this, uh, so there is that the, the MPs necessarily are not, you know, denying that aspect of their constituency level work. It's just they're saying, well, we do more than that. And in fact, that really isn't our constitutional mandate. Even though it isn't, we do address them. Because we do know, Doc, that, like I was saying earlier, people would go to them for everything ranging from school fees to funeral donations and everything, which they do, which would pretty much be in keeping in line or in the spirit of the example um, Brigadier gave here in respect of, you know, you know, trying to keep in touch or be in tune with the needs of your constituents, even though really and truly that may not be the constitutional mandate that you have to perform. But they do that nonetheless. But to the extent that they are being seen or they, it's appearing as though that is what it is they need to do, and if they fail to do that, then they are performed in a certain way. What, 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 what do you make of that? Let me first um, congratulate my colleagues for this research. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Yep. Whatever way we look at it, it gives us some meat to chew on. It helps us to uh, start the discussions. Yeah. Anything that initiates discussions is good for development. I think we have to blame ourselves as a society. Mm. We haven't educated people enough. Mm. We haven't sensitized people enough. I was going through the Constitution, Chapter 10. I was looking for even an article that would give me the functions of a member of parliament. Mm. It's not there. It's not provided for in the Constitution. The so question is, where is this thing about representation, lobbying, that's, and they're coming from? Is it people? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. getting there. <laughs> then you go to people that they should vote for a member of parliament. The understanding is that this person will have to represent them in parliament to champion their cause. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of championing their cause yes, in right. parliament? In my view, without referring to the Constitution, I voted for an MP. And I wanted that MP to go to parliament to champion my cause. My cause means there should be some level of development in my area. But my understanding of governance is that it is district assembly that brings development. So then my MP will have to work with the district assembly to, to bring, bring development. Two, I want to hear my MP contributing on national issues, making sure that our interest is catered for in national level policy. That is me. Sure. Somebody at the local level who may not understand governance like that, the person join the MP. Mm. You know, so for me, I think it will be most unfair if we are not able to come out clearly on what the exact functions of the MPs are before we do an assessment. And in that case, if you draw a generic conclusion that MPs are not performing, then you are not being fair to them. Because their performance is in two folds. One, bringing development from the perspective of the people. And then two, contributing to national level legislations. Mm. And some of them work a lot at the committee level. Some you don't even see them speaking on the floor. They do, some belong to two, three committees. You know, and they do a lot of work. So I think we have a lot of work to do as a nation. I like this report. But I think it opens a window of opportunity for NCC and all of us to educate people on the exact functions of the MPs. Mm. Look, they ask them the question, what is the role of MPs? Majority, as many as 50.8% said they advocate for development. Mm -hmm. Sure. And because that's what they campaign on, isn't it? <laughs> yes, that is what they campaign on. But, but from our governor's architecture... They have to lobby for it, but they sure. cannot do it. But that's a perception they give to uh -huh. the constituents. You see, that is, so I'm, I'm happy they are saying it's a perception. Yes. We have to erode that perception mm. and then let them understand that the MP would have to work with people to bring this one. If you put a lot of pressure on your MP to come and do development, to always be at the local level, it affects you at the national level. Is, 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 isn't it the case then that it is about time the MPs rewrote the narrative themselves? It or people... Be, 
potentially, you know, working to getting into such positions. My sister, we, right, the I, I think we need to help them. Ah, well. We, we need to help them ah, well. in law. Well, then, listen. I mean, at the end of the day, they are looking at the, 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 the office and they want to get in by hook or crook. Yes, you see, I have worked with them, but I tell you that at times I pity MPs. Mm. I tell you. They bring it on themselves. The kinds of demand people put on them. Ah, well. Some of them, some of them, their salary is even not enough to meet those needs. Now, we're going into the areas of the effect of that our kind right. of politics. So, yes, I, I which, think yeah. that there are two things that we can do. This is good, but we need to work on the minds of people. Mm. We need to educate them to understand the functions of the various uh, actors within the governance mm. chain. Mm. We need to help people appreciate the fact that, look, this assembly will have to do this. This is what your assembly member does. I bet you, if they do this same research on assembly members, they will get worse oh, report. Yeah. <laughs> they get worse report. Right. You understand? So, I, I, I think it's good, yeah. but I also think that in future, right. they, they, they should expand their research. Mm. It, because I see them concentrating on electoral areas. But within our governance architecture, electoral areas goes to assemblies. So they can work on the polling stations. And then I don't also see a proper balance between exactly. male and female. Because when you look at the voter population, is it based on the voter population in Ghana? But when you look at the voter population within that period, the males were, the females were more than the males. But when you look at the, the sample they used, you have more male here than the female. Mm. So then, how does it relate with the vo voter population? Mm. You know, so we need to look at right. all of that. I mean, yeah. the, the, your last point definitely would address issue. I mean, it would go to the methodology. Oh, th that's in, right. Yes, but in terms of the the role of parliament, which we are yet to define, or parliamentarians, which we are yet to define, con define concretely, that remains an issue. And I would want us to look at that. Okay. Because you talked about the MPs and their role in contributing to national issues and all of that. Right. We'll do that. But quickly, let me take your perspectives on what the, end, um, the speaker said, mm. that this research is inciting the electorates against um, 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 the parliamentarians. And this is coming from somebody who was in academia himself. And I mean, some people have, have raised issues about that, that really, is it, is, it, is, it, is it an appropriate thing to say that this is inciting electorates against their you know, MPs? He's from academia, but he did not atta attack the methodology. So we take the academia bit out. Mm. <laughs> now let's come to his work in parliament. I think he said that because of the impression the report uh, sought to present or create, that the MP's role is to only meet constituency level developmental needs without looking at their role at the national level. To that extent, I may want to agree with him. But I think that it is the first step it tells us that as a nation, we need to orient our people. That's our hammer on that. The education is very low. Mm. People think that once the MP does not do development, in fact, they, they interpret development to mean physical development. Mm. Even if an MP gives scholarship, mm. they don't see it as development. Well, speaking Isn't about it? the sensitization, let me you see, when this thing issue came up, I, my first point of call was the speaker's own inaugural speech That's when right. he was... Um, what was it called? When he was appointed as speaker. Mm, yeah, okay. I mean, his speech was super. He talked about transformational issues in there. I mean, things that would turn Parliament around. Oh, and yeah. I've highlighted a few. There's one on record keeping, which mm. goes to the issue about how MPs contribute mm. to national issues and all. And then speaking about the sensitization thing, he talks about that. And that was headed parliamentarians and their constituents. Of course, he alludes or acknowledges the fact that there's that mis conception about the role. So he says, uh, briefly, let me just read. He says, the question worth asking is, what do constituents expect from MPs? There's also growing evidence that public opinion is divided as to the role of MPs in Ghana. Mm -hmm. A significant majority of Ghanaians have a view that parliamentarians should undertake development projects within their constituencies. To others, MPs exist to pay school fees, give funeral donations, attend weddings and other social events, debating, passing legislation and holding the executive branch of government to account uh, rank low in the public perception of the role of MPs. Then he says this, that this also accounts for the high attrition rate of MPs. Now he goes on to say, a program dubbed Parliament Citizen Encounter is envisaged and will be pursued with the assistance of think tanks. I would want to know how yes, this, yeah. exactly, whether or not it has even come about, because how many years down the lane, two years, yeah. we yeah. should have seen something, if indeed mm -hmm. this was mm -hmm. a key issue. I mean, you were in uh, Parliament, you would know. Yes, well, well so far, Quickly. it's yeah. a lot of work that is being done. Okay. And my colleague will agree with me, but it's in the background. But you also forgot that uh, Speaker Michael Kui has also been very active in promoting the uh, processes to give room for private member bills, which I think in itself would also augment mm. and allow the constituents to see yeah. how you can 
initiate and, and advocate for a private member's bill to do mm. with their specific conditions and uh, situations. But you see, I just wanted to complement the point that uh, Dr. Oh, Osai okay. made. The NCC is one institution that I think as a nation, we need to resolve to resource. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 the inability of that institution to perform its function to the fullest has implications for the future of our democracy. Yeah. And if we don't begin to pay attention to augmenting the resource needs of the NCC to do its job, mm. I don't think that we would fully harvest right. the, benefits the products of our democracy. Yeah. Because this that we are saying, and many, many other issues, certainly fall within the ambit of the NCC. So I would want to also add my voice to the call. Mm. That in all of this that we, we, we are talking about, all the issues that we are raising, we need to commit to resourcing the NCC to satisfy its constitutional mandate. And if we were to do that, I think most of these issues, mm -hmm. whether it is the misunderstanding of the role of members of parliament or whether there is mm -hmm. the dichotomy between work by MPs in their constituencies okay. or even in uh, parliament, these issues will become clear. As I was just telling you, a lot of our constituents don't even know that if you absent yourself for a certain period of time, automatically you lose your seat. Right, which goes to one they point that I, know I that. want us to bring in the record keeping, and the, indeed the, the, the Speaker of Parliament did speak about that. But Mr. Ketri and Frimpo will need to leave us, so I'll come to you here. Your, let me have your concluding remarks, and if any way for that. Of course, you, your research pointed to some thought-provoking things that MP should consider. Yeah. But before that, let me say that what doctor said about us, the male-female ratio mm. has always been a problem. Okay. You enter a house and the woman will say, wait for my husband. <laughs> so if we've we got a ratio of 53.5 to 46, we have tried. Otherwise, we'll be there mm. till the kingdom come. That's true. Then there was this issue about the researchers. The minimum of our assistance, a qualification of our assistance researchers is that they finish the first degree. There are um, field people, there are PhD students as well. <laughs> no, but um, Prof, just a quick one. Mm -hmm. Language is a barrier, it's an issue. In my community, for example, if, 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 if they the native speakers of Bully, want to, how was we, the we information to do that. <laughs> we try to do that. Mm -hmm. But if we, but point, we, you can't we have really want to explain yeah. everything about this methodology, you will never go. Very well. But, uh, but, but I'm like taking advantage of my presence here. <laughs> <laughs> when well, my people are watching. Point so. well made. <laughs> you are representing them well. Yes. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so the issue about why we took uh, electoral areas and so on, polling stations, okay, but we think that there are no more polling stations within the electoral area. We, we consider those, those things. But uh, on the other side, I was trying to say that we made a number of points looking ahead. And my very first one was that we should be careful about the promises mm -hmm. because now increasingly people are uh, uh, judging us by those things. Mm -hmm. I also emphasize that our constituents are very concerned about the absence of the MPs and interaction with them, so it needs improvement. And I had this other interesting one that MPs must gauge the mood of their constituents <laughs> in deciding whether or not to contest again. <laughs> that I've, was an interesting I've done one. this uh, thing for all the elections mm -hmm. in Ghana, and sometimes I can see an MPU started with a margin of about 40%. It keeps dwindling down. It's within less than 10%, and he still wants to go for another step. And what was the result? In the last election, 50 incumbent MPs lost their primaries. 50 others lost the election. So I, 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 And did I, those 50 have the telltale signs, which you know you, you talk about in terms of dwindling, you know, uh, margins? Yes. Did they? Yes, so I, those had, were I had looked the, at the it long before, on the wall. and several of them I knew they were not going to make it. Oh. <laughs> and I also talk about the fact that the longer we stay, they stay in parliament, the better. The better yeah. But it's as if, uh, rather than the Mugabe's, it is the first MS who are in becoming endangered mm. species. So I emphasize that maybe they have a lot to learn from the long MS, but maybe they are 
peculiar programs. I think we might think they haven't settled in yet, and yet primaries are around the corner. Mm. So is there something we can do to have first termers, to prop them up? Because if the turnover, the attrition rate is so high, it has not do any good for the MPs. And finally, and in part, in fact, it was part of the major reason why we did it at this time. It's a midterm examination. Mm. And in fact, all these problems that we are having with the averages and so on, if in any midterm you are 40% and above, you are not bad. You can improve and cross mm. over the 50%. Mm. So I said, 18 months in politics is a long time for better or for worse, to mm. make or to break. <laughs> Unfortunately, given the way this was communicated by the media, some of these important points raised got lost. I think, I think, yeah, the, the, the highlights or the catchy part was about the, you know, the 180 first timers. Yes. Who were yes. uh, There are 120 of them. Okay. And only a third of them made it with the support of 50% or above, a large majority. And sometimes also, even before they start, there is a problem. You won by 0.1%. So already there is a problem. Mm -hmm. I have said it, all those things. So there are a number of MPs who are going to be first term MPs. It has always been because of the margin you won. Maybe there was a confusion in the uh, opposition party which dominates the area and you went through. Mm. If they unite again, you mm. are in trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been looking at all those things mm -hmm. and that's why I felt we should look at these things further. and yeah. see what we can do about it. Right. We need to take a quick break, but before we go, um, what do you make of um, the speaker's, um, if you like, um, is it proposal that you know next time you consult um, parliament? This issue of consulting parliament if it's about all of us agreeing that now it's not going to be on the constituency level, but at parliament and even at international. And parliament is prepared to sponsor us to do research for all the three arms. It's not bad. But if it is to mean that we should consult the MPs before we go to do the work, if we had done that, I'm sure we have met the supporters of the incumbents mm -hmm. in the mm. uh, areas that we went to do. So I don't really know, but let me say that <laughs> it was the speaker who introduced me to research. <laughs> and at one station yesterday, I had to grant, uh, give him <laughs> happy Father's Day and remind him that I'm doing the job that he, he taught, taught you. me to do. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, well. On that note, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we won't have uh, Ms. Alex Kinchu Duku from Paul with us because he needs to take leave of us. But thank you so much um, uh, for coming through to share your, you know, the insights into the research. We appreciate that so much. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be back to look at the other um, topics outlined for discussion. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also at TV3 Ghana. That's on our Facebook page. So we're moving on next to look at the um, rescuing of the two Canadian young girls um, early on in the week and, of course, matters that have come up subsequent to that. Um, we've been joined in the studio by Kenel Festus Abwaje. He is a security analyst, and Kenel, you're welcome. It's Thank good you. to have you here. Um, so we are looking at the situation. The Canadian girls were, um, you know, allegedly kidnapped and earlier on. And then um, earlier on in the week, we had uh, information that they had been rescued, um, pursuant to uh, collaborative efforts by the security services of the country. And indeed, um, we were delighted by that, you know, um, revelation, because it at some point was sending lots of negative um, publicity in respect of the country. The information minister tells us that the operation um, took less than half an hour, and we're quite pleased by that. I, won't, I want to start with you, Kenel, about you here. I mean, this situation is worth 
commending in terms of how the you know the the, the forces, the security forces or agencies react um, dealt with it. But aside, you know, in as much as we're celebrating that, there's also the um, unsettling feeling about um, a supposed you know increase in the 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 the, the, the incidents of kidnapping. As a security analyst, what are your thoughts? What what is your hunch in respect of you know this situation and the particularly the involvement any time a kidnapping situation occurs of some foreigners and in, in this regard we're looking at Nigerians. It's a sensitive matter but we do need to you know confront yeah. it at some point. Thank you very much. Uh, you shouldn't have started with me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nevertheless I think we personally I'm looking at the, the whole narrative with with mixed feelings. On the one hand, yes, as you said, we need to celebrate at least the successful rescue or release, depending on how you put it, mm. of the Canadian girls. Given that they were foreigners or they are foreigners, the implications for the country, if anything worse than just the kidnapping had happened, would have been a bit more serious and enormous. So we should all be very happy uh, that the girls have been found. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis or in comparison with or to the Takwadi girls, it's, it's, it's a completely different uh, dimension. I've been arguing since the debate started that the two kidnapping cases are not the same. Mm -hmm. The dynamics may be similar, but definitely they are not the same. What to me is worrisome, and probably where the debate should be, is the management of the two incidents of kidnapping. On the one hand, we saw a bit more proactivity uh, with regards to the Canadian girls. But in the case of our own girls, uh, we need to admit and that is why I get a bit worried when consistently certain segments of society tend to suggest that uh, they've done the best. We've not done the best. We bundled and botched the operation right from the beginning, given the fact, among others, that we allowed the suspect to break jail mm. for quite a number of days and, as a result, compromised all the evidence that the police could have used, you know, to be on the tracks of, of those kidnappers. Uh, in the process, our image was, was, was damaged. I was just listening to one radio station, which is another part of the management, saying that, and this is a sister of one of the kidnapped girls, mm -hmm. the Takwadi girls, mm -hmm. that since 1st May, when the police liaison team was introduced to them, since 1st May, they've not seen the police. So the public information side, you know, the, the management of the psyche of the families who are the victims, and indeed all of us as Ghanaians, has not been very well handled. Now, look critically <coughs> at the platforms that we've chosen to pronounce ourselves on the case of the Takradi girls, and also look at the platform or platforms that we've used in the case of the Canadians. And you see a clear disparity. In the case of the Takwari girls, we had the Minister of Information as soon as the operation was over. You mean with the Canadian girls? Canadian girls, sorry please, uh, to tell us what had happened. Now, did we see the same thing with regards to the Takwari girls? Wouldn't this show in the minds of many Ghanaians that were picking and choosing attaching certain degrees of importance to the, two, um, to the two cases. I get a sense also, uh, maybe I'm digressing a bit, that the police is being gagged. But the way and manner in which the minister took the platform and spoke alone on the issues of interest and concern to all of us, uh, to me suggested something. Yeah with a police chief sitting and not saying anything, you know. Uh, have we done the same in the case of the, of the Takwadi uh, uh, girls? We should be delighted, I suppose, that a few days ago we, we got hold of one of the suspects. Personally, I'm afraid that's a bit too late.
it doesn't appear that the girls are in this country. In fact, Daily Guide has told us, if it is true, that the girls are somewhere in eastern Nigeria. So getting hold of this John uh, OG, okay. if, if I'm right, mm -hmm. uh, is a good lead. It may be a break, but whether he can actually lead us to where the girls are. And I'm beginning to suspect that. The girls may not even at this time be in Nigeria, that they may have been flown somewhere into Europe or whatever it is. So we need to learn quite a number of uh, serious lessons. If I may want to you know, end my mm -hmm. preliminary points here. Another issue of concern to me is that we tending to be ad hoc in how we manage security in this country. So if kidnapping was not an issue, and indeed when you look at all the police statistics, you don't even see kidnapping. You see kijacking, you see robbery, you see abduction, you see rape and so on. You don't see kidnapping. Have we begun to develop a concrete, comprehensive strategy to address um, this, this issue of kidnapping? Or are we just talking about it? And when the dust settles, that is the end of it, you see. I want to argue that security is indivisible. So whether we're talking about robbery or um, armed Car robbery jacking. or rape or kidnapping or carjacking or whatever it is, all of these, together with even um, Galamse, they have some interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. So the earlier we put down some strategies, and let me tell you, go to the internet now. And you see a number of strategies for the US, for the UK, for Canada, for everybody on counterterrorism. Now, when you go to the same internet, you're looking for Ghana's counterterrorism strategy. Because terrorism is now an existential, or it, it is a threat mm -hmm. to Ghana. Now, what you see are statements in the media by certain individuals, you know, obviously politicians and so on, saying that. Uh, we are doing this, we'll be doing that. But where is the strategy? This idea that we approach all issues, not only security, on an ad hoc basis, sitting around the table, taking certain platforms, making pronouncements, then we go back, we don't have any concrete plans around which we're going to you know, uh, address these Very issues. Well. I think that is, that is worrisome. Very well, great. So I'll turn to... Um, let's listen to the information minister as he informed the public uh, about the rescue of the Canadian girls and then we return to the panelists. I'll go to um, Eja Famesa for his perspectives on this as well. So let's take a listen to the Honorable Minister of Information. Intelligence. No foreign assets were involved in the operation. I repeat, no foreign assets were involved in the operation. Now, since the day of the abduction of these two women, security operatives have been working their contacts with the hope of rescuing them. Intelligence gathering efforts enabled the security agencies to zero in on persons who were associated with the incident. At 1900 hours on June 11, 2019, the first arrest was made in connection with this incident. According to... Okay, so we heard, that was the, um, Mr. Kojo Ponkrumah, the um, information minister there speaking to the um, 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 press at that, um, on that day. And essentially, that particular um, clip, we heard him talk about the the the, the collaborate the role, whether or not there was foreign collaboration, which indeed has become uh, one of the you know, if you like sticking points. For some reason, it has become uh, an issue being tossed about whether or not there was um, 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 foreign collaboration in this regard. I will turn to you, Mr. Jefamesa, taking into consideration what the minister said, and also some um, aspects of what Colonel um, Awaji talked about the role of the minister in the Canadian girls' situation um, as opposed to how the Takradi girls' um, situation has been handled in terms of, if you like, 
the prominence with which we dealt with this, suggesting that, you know, there appears to be a certain choosy way of dealing. That's the perception out there. It may not necessarily no. be the case, but that's the perception out there. And coincidentally, you come from that area where the... I, I largely goes. agree with uh, Kennel. Kennel respect to some aspect of the management of the Takradi girls' uh, kidnapping. Of course, I was not particularly pleased mm. with the CID boss's statement uh, to the effect that the girls, uh, they knew where the girls were, <coughs> and subsequently uh, that turned out to be uh, some hope that she had sought to give to uh, the families as she subsequently came to tell us. And so to that extent, you know, I uh, mm. agree with him. But uh, to suggest that there's been some selectivity, some picking and choosing, mm. uh, is what I disagree with. Of course, I'm sure that if the Takrade girls are rescued, uh, some press conference in the nature of what happened in the Canadian girls who had been rescued would, would be held mm. to brief Ghanaians on what it is that went into right. uh, rescuing them. Uh, as we speak, unfortunately, they have not been rescued. And so I would not think that it would be appropriate for the minister to, uh, as it were, mount a press conference mm. and just tell us the steps that they are taking to ensure that the girls are rescued, you know. And so to suggest that this approach where they conferred with the security necessarily, because as he rightly said, the uh, police chief and, and, and the national security minister were all present. Uh, they, I'm sure, having conferred, decided that the Minister of Information should address all the issues mm. relating to uh, the kidnapped girls, the Canadian matter. And, and so, I mean, the uh, choice of uh, uh, delivery in itself does not amount to, uh, in my view, uh, selectivity. Mm. Gagging the police, I think, would be far-fetched, uh, particularly in view of the explanation that I've just proffered. Right. You know, uh, with respect to the Takradi girls, of course, they've not been discovered. And so the police have sought to give us some update as and when, uh, you know, regarding uh, uh, the status of their investigations, okay. you know. Uh, and so they are free to, uh, at all times, provide us with some update. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, the family are saying, if it's indeed the case, it will be unfortunate. Uh, because the assurance that the Minister of Information gave uh, following or during the press conference was that equal attention and resources are being deployed to ensure that the Takradi girls are found. Of course, uh, they were not abducted or kidnapped the same day. And so the situation with respect to each of them differs mm -hmm. from what pertained with respect to the Canadian girls. They were ab abducted at one time. If, if my memory serves me right, uh, the first kidnap of the Takradi girls took place sometime in August or so. Yeah. And then there was a December uh, uh, or two in December. Mm. You know, so the dynamics really are, are different. different. And I've been told, when I hear the experts say that in these matters, the, 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 the earlier the report yeah. to the police, the, 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 the better it is for the police to react and, and find them. Which is one you of know, the things that are being said that I, 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 regarding, absolutely. Yeah. you know, so, so, so it is my fervent hope that whatever it takes that the state security agencies will do to bring these girls to their families uh, or at least bring some closure, whichever way it goes, uh, would, would help to, to, to ensure that uh, we, we get some peace. Uh, you know, these, this is close hope. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, even though it's not in my constituency right. direct, it's close, within yeah. the sec second Itakradi metropolis mm. and i share the pain of of the families who are grieving uh, not having closure to this matter and and i, I think that you know uh, the canadians commendable uh, we should commend our state mm -hmm. security agencies for 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 coming out uh, it would really have been not much to uh, for the minister to stress that no foreign assets were used. <clears throat> but you know the nature of our political. Uh, we've even changed the real issue from 
the criminals who have been arrested and have been arraigned before court and remanded to the political color of the mm. of the suspects makes you wonder and and of course it was based on that speculation that had come earlier that the minister had to uh, re-emphasize the point that look this is purely state security agents who had gone out there but really and truly to, to what, i mean all over there, there are always collaborative efforts when yes, it comes to security. I, I so if indeed it happened, it wouldn't be a big deal. But yeah, like I said, that's exactly what I said. Given but we, our opponents, are playing politics with it. Mm. But if, that if the Canadian experts had not been flown here, our state security agents, not government security agents, they fail to distinguish that these personnel are not NPP personnel. They are state mm. officials. Okay, essentially rubbishing the work that the state security <laughs> apparatus had done because of the notion to politicize everything in this country. And so quickly rubbish the work that they done. Oh, the, the MPP government hasn't done anything. It was the Canadians who came in to rescue the girls. No, but is, is that the it. route to go? Mm -hmm. Is that the route to go? Mm -mm, I mean, I've said that whether these suspects are from QQQ, FFF, NPP, NDC, for me, it doesn't matter. NPP is not vicariously liable for the actions of mm -hmm. its members. Crime is crime, regardless of it's who personal. commits it. It's personal. But what did we hear? To the extent that a whole political party held an official press conference I think at this to point, describe I, I will, the persons will, who had been arrested I will just, I will as move agents on. of a political party. <laughs> Dr. Alpak, yes. can, can you imagine? I think the issue that confronts us now is bigger than that, those, you know. But, but obviously, those, you can't expect not to respond. I'm not saying you won't respond, definitely, Very but for us to degenerate those kinds of issues, I, I, no. I, I think I'm there's not, a much more important issue which has I, to do I with appreciate, the lives. I appreciate your point. Young ladies who we don't know where they are currently. Abba, but yes. I appreciate your point uh, very much. But it is only fair that I take it from where he left off. It is indeed the case that crime should have no color. We should not try to use politics as a conduit to cover up crime. Unfortunately, we are all guilty of this offense. And I think that it is heartwarming that finally our friends on the other side have come to the realization that crime is crime and should not be politicized. You, you remember not long ago there was an incident in the Ashanti region uh, involving some shooting incident. At your party head office. And, and, and how office. was that not a crime? So why was it that those who engaged in that reprehensible act were being politicized as belonging to a particular political party. So it is refreshing when the that, that we, we no, 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 no. The Let's, point I'm making is that we have a, a very we have reached a state where we now agree girls, yes. that as a nation we should treat crime as crime. Mm -hmm. And see, so you must understand where my party also came from. But when the impression is created that uh, perhaps your party chairman is the kingpin facilitating promoting and sponsoring events of this nature, and you see an opportunity to indicate otherwise, what would you do? You would state it very forcefully. But Somebody this was, this was a matter that record. was on the floor of parliament for discussion yesterday. Indeed, the member of parliament in whose constituency, the building where the hostages, the two Canadian girls were being held, did a statement on the floor of parliament. And members contributed. The same sentiments mm. were expressed. So I think now we have plateaued in terms of so trying to colorize enough. crime. So let's and if we would all agree yeah. that this is the new way forward, I think it would augur well for the well-being of our security in this country. But coming to the bigger issue, it is heartwarming that the girls have been found. Although when you read the Canadian media, and mind you have stayed in Canada for several years, they are saying they were released. We are saying they were rescued. Perhaps that is just a difference in the use of language. 
But whatever be the case, they have been found. And from the information that we are all privy to, uh, no harm has been caused to them. And it is our expectation that those who engage in this act, which has certainly had a dent on our reputation in, in the community of nations, would face the full rigors of the law. Because these types of actions and attitudes and acts of crime cannot be condoned. And it is even more worrying because this is not the first time we are seeing this. We are so in search for our own three daughters, sisters, who we, we cannot find. But even between when that occurred and this resolved challenge, other attempts had been made. You sure. remember the, sure. the, uh, the, Indian, the, the Indian Estonian. businessman, yeah. the Estonian? So something is definitely going on. <laughs> something is going on in the system that allows the criminal element to think that they can do these things and get away with it. What is that? What is wrong? What is happening that allows, in all the two the instances that we know so far, foreign elements to partner with domestic saboteurs to engage in this type of conduct? And I believe that we have senior persons mm -hmm. here who have a, the, a better mm -hmm. background in security to help us understand we'll be looking something is not right. In, in that but but that. coming up, coming back to our own challenge where you cannot fault Ghanaians for raising questions and trying to compare the attitude of the state security agencies, the conduct of government on these two different uh, 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 instances of kidnapping. Why is it that we couldn't have been proactive in the case of the Takra Diggles? Is it not the same state security apparatus that was in existence? Some have suggested is it not the, the same police force? When it got to the police and all of that, those, those, yeah, but, but those facts we need to yes, really look but, but, at. But, but from what to I be know, able to make such a conclusion, he, may, he may be able to mm -hmm. help us. But I wouldn't think that any parent would notice the absence of your ward or your child for 24 hours and not report. What that means is that there was a lapse somewhere. Somebody was probably sleeping on the job. Possible. And we need to be able to identify some of these lapses and deal with the public officers. Mm -hmm. Whose lack of professionalism has led to, lead this point, yes. to these kinds of affairs? Okay. Oh, but I'm not know, even surprised yeah. that this, the chief suspect in this case was able to break jail. Of course, that was something that in that itself is something that eight days. should cause us to shiver. How is that possible? And what has happened to those officers who failed to perform their roles that allow for that guy to break jail? And he named. He named exactly some, somebody in the service as having, you know, a system. So what is happening? Well, that we need to... So when Kennel speaks about... Kennel yeah. speaks about, you know, the challenges that we have, I think we must also look at the, the system management and the structure issues, yeah. and a clearly defined, if you like, process of how to handle some of these issues. And I'm, I would say, and I, I've said this before, the commander-in-chief... Mr. President, needs to address this nation on our security challenges. Mm. There we go again. No, 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 no. But, but look, mm -hmm. let's, let's not play the ostrich. Mm -hmm. We have had a series of security challenges. It is not sufficient to be outside of the, 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 the boundaries of Ghana, speaking about how secure your nation is in the West African enclave. Give us the assurance here. Tell us what you are doing, the pragmatic steps you are taking to address these challenges. Very well. On and that, I think that, uh, on that, that is a call that I will continue to make mm. because we look up to him. Very well. Whether so, we like it or not, he is the person we have entrusted our destiny into his hands. And he has a singular responsibility of ensuring that we feel secured very so well. that we can and go we need, about... we need him to address the state, we, the, the, the nation on that issue. He has to. Which I'm very proud. well. On that note, we take a quick break. Joe, when we come I back, didn't, I didn't yeah. mean we'll I was come back to I'm continue bad. with the discussion I'm on bad, the Get rescuing of, of the Canadian girls really. and matters arising, particularly with the um, angle on the Chakradi girls who are still missing. We'll see you shortly. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back. This is The Key Point. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're currently looking at um, uh, the rescuing of the two Canadian girls and matters arising. We're also delving into the related issue of the Takrade girls. Question is, where are they? And um, uh, that's the rescuing of the Canadian girls present, you know, hope for us in our search for these girls. We'll be going to um, the rest of the panelists to give their perspectives on this. But before then, let me quickly take some messages from our viewers and listeners. This one's coming in from Seydou in Akuse. He says, good morning, Abna and your able panelists. We must commend the researchers and their findings. He says, this is indeed what we expect from academia. I will entreat serious MPs not to ignore the findings just like what happened prior to the 2016 general elections. You remember the same team said MPP was going to win the elections and what was the result? He says, hashtag JM for 2020. Gilbert Yinbil in Tamale says, Up now the MP should stop challenging the researchers and sit up. I think it's just a wake up call for them to make amends before the election set in. Their posture is like they want to appear untouchable anytime there's something coming up and it is about parliament, they always react to it. Um, some of the MPs only remember they have subordinates when they need our votes, but hardly do they come back to the constituencies to brief us on their plans in collaboration with the government uh, towards the development of the constituencies. We are fully prepared and awaiting them come 2020. That is acidic lambon. Um, Mustafa from Wulente says, I think the MPs are misunderstanding the plight of their constituents. What we want is to see them from time to time, interact with us and feel and feel what we feel and also bring development to the doorsteps of their constituents. Um, good morning, Abna. This is coming in from Awal Mohammed in Accra. So he says, Ghana remains safe, says government. Um, government should just give us a break. Who is safe in Ghana when there's political arrest, daylight um, robberies, kidnapping of both foreigners and citizens all over the country when our uh, enabling countries or neighboring countries are issuing terrorist alerts about us aziz from nalerugu says this research is simply a wake-up call for all mps mps should always spell out their rules to their constituents perfectly rather than promising them for things or promising them things that they cannot offer we're losing faith in our parliamentarians. Um, I'll move on to look at other things that are coming in respect of um, the security issue and uh, later on, but I'll, I'll pull the brakes on the messages at this point. When we get more, I will carry on with that. So we're returning to the discussions here and um, I will go to um, 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 Brigadier General Nunu Mensa for your reaction to this whole um, incident, or yes, incident about the rescuing of the Canadian girls, <coughs> and also listening to you know the discussion so far, what it is you make of the growing, if you like, the repeated or the recurrent cases of kidnappings that are coming. Because like we said earlier, even before the Canadians, we had news of the you know Indian who was arrested, but of course. Um, uh, his rescue was also successful, and then there was an Estonian, and you know, we are, but we are still currently grappling with mm -hmm. the Takwadu girls. Thank you very much. When I look at this this issue in particular, I, I think wide and deep, and ask myself. I mean, over the years, the situation in Ghana has been deteriorating, not only Ghana but the world as a whole. I mean, these girls who were kidnapped. I, I remember, as a growing up child in Winneba at the beach, these people used to come and sleep at the beach in hammocks, white people, with their clothing just by them. And nobody harmed them. Nobody harmed them. The beaches were so clean, nobody ever thought of harming them. You know, and this went on for many years. People didn't lock their doors. Then all of a sudden, things are worsening over the years, progressively worsening. Not only in Ghana, as I said. So I asked myself, what is happening? What is the underlying causes of this situation? Like, when I'm with you, I woke up very early, and I, I get worried. I, I just think about Ghana and worry how long Ghana will be there in your lifetime. How long will the world be there? And I know maybe 
I don't need to worry, but I need to worry because <laughs> I don't like what I see, what I hear. You know, you, you look at our sub-region, but yesterday in Mali, there was some terrible things happening there. Bukana Faso, about two weeks ago, in a church, you went to people and, and met and slaughtered them. I mean, what the hell is going on in the world? So something is happening. So we have to be aware that the world is not the same world that I came to meet some 18 years and over ago. It's changing. And you should be aware of the change and take necessary actions to forestall whatever is coming along with the change taking place. Talking about to our two politicians here, our parliamentarians, I mean, I'm not surprised they are shouting there. <laughs> I was in Britain in 1963, went to the House of Commons, no, 61, rather. And the MPs were behaving like this. But after that, they would go and sit and drink beer. So I hope that they will drink beer after that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but seriously speaking, our institutions are being damaged. School institutions, the military, the police, all of them are being damaged because of political interference. Not only here, but even in America, greater America. America is not what I knew when I went there in 1968. To look at what's happening between, between the uh, two major parties, that are major parties, they're at war with each other. And I see something, some virus is, uh, is, is, is <laughs> you know, affecting our politicians all over. I mean, I don't know what the hell is going on. And it worries me that the rate at which we are going, if we don't take care, we will cause a lot of mayhem to ourselves mm. and our country. Yeah. You know, as, as in, you don't need to be a saint to be uh, a philosopher to see all this. You can, if you've got a trained mind, you can see what is happening. I drive and I see, I see a driver go through red light just at the, at the plaque surface here. What? At the Jubilee House, another problem. Jubilee House, plaque surface, Jubilee House. So you could pull a electric pool. Now, this kind of thing, I made a mistake, call it plaque surface. That's what it used to be. That's what it was when Nkrumah took it over from the army. Then we changed the name. We changed it. See, you should have the courage. I mean, to speak our mind and speak the truth. But the governor was my, I was his campaign manager, 1990, you don't know. I know him very well, more than any other politician. I to eat with him. Then that means if it, something was going wrong, I should say it. I have the courage and say it. We are going astray because, oh, this is MPP, this is NDC. But Ghana is going astray. Mm. So why do you come to power and change the whole security system, change everybody there? You don't build expertise. Knowledge comes from experience. And if you don't have experience, you, you have what you're having with the, with the, the talk about the girls and all that's happening. I'm not saying that you should get to perpetuity, perpetuity, but let's build some experience so you can call back. I mean, I have been with the intelligence in 1963 when Nkoma was there. And in Russia, America, Britain, it's been everywhere. You build this expertise. But when you come to power and suddenly you shift the world away and bring new people there, that is lost. And the Ghana loses. So what I'm saying here is that all this happens because there is too much political interference and we should stop it. It's not helping Ghana. Yeah. You know, let the, let the institutions of states, as Honorable said, they're of state, not of MPP and DC. Let them be so. If you come to power and I'm the chief of defense staff or the IGP or the in charge of national security, Doing my job, why do you have to change? I mean, I don't understand why we have to do these changes and throw away knowledge and experience. You're talking about someone like Kofi Kwanzaa, a man who I highly respect. This knowledge wasn't built over, it was over a long period. So all these are happening because of reasons which you should understand. We are treating the, cause, the, 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 the symptoms, not the causes of this kidnapping. Right. We are teaching with the Why were they arrested? Why are they picked up? Why? Why at all? In my time, I never wanted to pick anybody, although I was coming from a poor background. My children didn't go about picking people up because uh, of what? You know, so we should try to understand where we are coming from. Mm -hmm. Why these changes? Why? We have young people roaming the streets. It didn't start yesterday or with young people. It's long happened mm -hmm. who have no jobs. I didn't, I'm not from I'm a vandal or whatever. I didn't, have, I didn't even have the chance of going near, near university of uh, any university. But I became chief of defense staff from a very poor background, you know. So let's 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 oh, let's stop interfering mm. with our. Let's allow the state institutions to work. To work. Yeah. So at least, girl, for example, mm. you're talking about no harm done. 
Who said no harm done? Where did they put them? Where did they sleep? Where, where did they? This guy, I've been in Canada, I've been in Canada for one year. I know Canada very well. I trained in, in, the, in the army at the South College in Kingston. Trudeau's, President Trudeau's son wasn't even born while I was there. Correct, Prime Minister. <laughs> but the father even wasn't married at the one I was there, mm. let alone before. Yes, he's a right. Prime Minister today. Mm -hmm. And also, let, let our young people, now that I'm talking about Trudeau, our young people take charge. You see, there's too much NDC and people. I keep on talking because it is destroying this country. Right. I don't like it. Very well. So learn, learn lessons from this and stop being too political. Right, very well. This matter. Thanks for that, Brigadier. I'll go to Doc now. Would you make of all this is happening? Yeah, thank you, Abna. See, I think, one, the issue of ad hoc approach to security issues, mm -hmm. and we want to subscribe to that. Um, crime is moving at great speed. The world is not waiting for anybody. I think that if we really want to catch up with what is happening, we have to be a step ahead of criminals. My personal view is that we've opened our borders too wide. Um, I think it is about time we manage our bodies, we manage our system. Globalization is good, ECOWAS is good, but not to the disadvantage of the country. Let me also say that it is about time we strengthen the relationship between citizens, security agencies and government. Security agencies thrive on information. My sense is that the average Ghanaian is not security conscious. Call a home, ask of one question or ask one question, and they'll give you about a thousand answers. Mm -hmm. Volunteered information. Two, look at the number plates, vehicle number plates we have in this country, especially the foreign number plates. Some of them, we haven't even oriented our people to even memorize them. Some, it is even difficult for you to even mention them. What have we done about that? Three, let us look at the Takradi girls and then the Canadian uh, girls that were rescued or released. I think the two are not the same. I want to agree. The two are not the same. Colonel mentioned that um, the Minister of Information came up and then gave us the information. Why didn't we do the same for the Takradi girls? I think the Canadian girls assumed an inter international dimension. And the president chairs the National Security Council, and the Minister for Information is the spokesperson for government. I think that was what happened. If going forward, we think we should have coordinated information for citizens, let us agree on that score. But I think we should encourage citizens to give out information to the police on time. An issue was raised here about the role of the police at the early stages of the kidnapping of the Tagrandi mm -hmm. girls. That I agree. I mean. The, the, the laxity was just too much. Yep. Because how do you allow somebody to escape? And within the eight-day period, what happened? Was there any information that he's compromised with so that it would prevent us from further um, uncovering the other issue that would help us bring out these girls? What I think we need to do going forward, I am always interested in solutions. That one, let us make sure that we equip our security agencies to be a step ahead of criminals. Mm -hmm. Two, let us raise awareness among Ghanaians. Awareness among, let us be security conscious. Right. If you are going somewhere and a vehicle is trailing you, if you have a, a, somebody, a, a suspicious character around, who to talk to? But again, let me also say this to the security agencies. They should be able to protect their informants. It's very important. Ghanaians wants assurance that when we give you the information, you protect our identity. If you blow their cover, that's the end of you. You deter people. And that is what many people are afraid of. Many people have information they want to give out. But the question is, how would I be protected? So the question then is, how are we implementing our Witness Protection Act or people who provide information? How are we protecting them? That assurance must be sent to the people. And then let me also say that with the oil find in this country, I am not surprised these things are happening. We should have anticipated it. Because once you have oil in your country, these people will follow up. And while there's a gold mine, and then that gold mine is no more working, that, those workers, where do they go? So all these things are in there. The reason is, where is our security strategy? And I like the question he asked. But I'm not an expert. Though I'm sandwiched between a camera and a beginner general, I'm happy this morning. Our security strategy, if we put it on the internet, Kendall, don't you think these terrorists and people will know it ahead of time and be a step ahead of us? 
be it as it may, how do we manage it? Our borders are too porous. We have we 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 we, we are off, we, we have overly accepted or admitted some people in this country. All of a sudden, the upset of crime that were previously alien to Ghanaians are coming up. What do we do under the circumstance? Let us rationalize our system. Let us close our bodies. Mm -hmm. Not closing as it as it not um, working with people or interacting okay. with people. But let us manage ourselves. Right. Let us open our eyes widely. Very well. Now, mm -hmm. um, to Kenel, speaking of um, our bodies and how lax we've been about it, I go back to the issue I raised earlier about the involvement of certain, you know, mm. particular groups of foreigners in this. Sensitive as it is, it's an issue we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the highlight for me in all these kidnapping cases has, has, has been the fact that in all of them, there's an element of a Nigerian, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. In the Takwadi cases, there's, there's been a recent arrest, and the person arrested is also Nigerian. Mm -hmm. Now, in the um, Canadian groups, they are all like that. Now, how do we deal with that? Because, yes, it's about keeping our borders safe. But there's also this pressure about, you know, integration. There's a certain relationship with Nigeria, a long-standing one, I must say. But at the end of the day, it's about protecting the nationals. Mm. How do we deal with it? Well, the, thank you very much. Let me <coughs> just respond quickly to mm -hmm. the question of publicizing strategies. Right. On the contrary. If you don't publish your strategies, you lose strategic impact. Okay. Only this week I have had occasion to say that anything we put out there could be used, especially by academia, as case studies. And I want the country to realize that we have not established these institutions of higher learning just for people to go and obtain degrees. There's a lot that they can do, you know, to, to try and influence this situation. Publicizing it creates that awareness. It's part of creating the awareness for everybody to know. And there are broad outlines. Yeah. They know the details. Yeah. Okay. The broad outlines of how Ghana intends to tackle a range of threats. So that's what I want to say. Now, yeah. the question of the foreign element, mm -hmm. you see, it is one of the, uh, the compromises as far as sovereignty goes of belonging to uh, a multilateral uh, organization. So this 1979 ECOWAS protocol on free movement and establishment and so on, we're bound by it. And as a good citizen of that multilateral arrangement, I don't think Ghana should even contemplate uh, redrawing from it. The protocol, however, does not say that when people have entered your country, they have the right to violate your laws. Mm. And that is where the challenge begins. The challenge begins from the point of entry. Okay. What kind of information do we obtain from persons who are entering this country? What kind of arrangements have we put in place to be able to find them when we want, we want them? Let me bore you by giving you one example. I have been invited to, I think, Copenhagen. So that could be about 2005. Now I go to the airport, and they say that I must, uh, I must show them why I was coming into the country. So I show them the letter of invitation from an institution of higher learning. They were not satisfied. They took their phone and called a number indicated in the letter. I wouldn't argue that they were profiling me. But you see, given their strategy, they will randomly select certain individuals and put them through the mail. Are we doing the same? Yeah. So we need a bit of collaboration, serious collaboration between immigration and customs, between police, especially CID. Mm -hmm. Part of the blame also is us Ghanaians. Yeah. Now, these Nigerians, the main accomplices in the Canadian, uh, the hijacking of the Canadian girls, who rented that building to them? What kind of information did the landlord or the property owner obtain from them? What kind of checks, background checks, did that you know, uh, landlord or property owner do? That is part of the problem. Take Hamile. Mm -hmm. 
This Bukinabe guy, one or two of them, whatever the number, had entered Ghana for five weeks. Beyond that, he had been employed as a mason. So are there no laws that regulate employment of foreigners? Mm -hmm. So this laissez-faire at atmosphere, I'm not saying Togoli shouldn't come to Ghana, but we all know, people have said it on there, that their houses were built oh, yes. by Togolese, to that Togolese yeah. artisans <laughs> are the best. Mm -hmm. You see, so it's become part of our culture. We don't ask questions, and we need to stop, mm. especially in this mm. day and era, mm. if we want to go ahead. Now, the alert. <clears throat> um, in a certain context, we have expressed a bit of concern about the alert, but it's part of international practice. Haven't we ourselves alerted Ghanaian citizens <laughs> not to travel across uh, the Sahel to, to uh, what do you call it, to Europe? It's part of the alert system. Now, between creating panic and between creating awareness, I would say that let's create the awareness. You see, it. rather than say that by creating awareness, putting out information, you're creating panic in society. The rank and file Ghanaian may not know how to approach certain situations. And all the preparedness that we've been talking about, we've talked about CCTV. This is another thing that worries me. See, we mention terminologies as if they are the strategy. Where do you play CCTVs? For instance, at our toll booths across the country, do we have CCTV? Maybe we don't have. Temamoto Way, we don't have. In Samoan Road, we don't have. But all of these are mechanisms that help the police to track. Some time ago, I have heard it, a certain prominent politician saying that we're going to bring in, uh, I've seen it in Kenya, there are cameras, you know, that sit on, on roads, and they flash and can photograph your plate number. Since that politician talked about it, where are the cameras? And that's what I'm saying. You go to the internet and you see statements that have been made two years. In fact, this national security strategy is on the internet. 2017, somebody pronounced himself that we're going to do it. So I put it on Facebook that since 2017, where is this national security strategy? That attitude, you know, to me is, is a bit worrisome. Going beyond the rhetoric is what we need. Yes. Actually. Then the context, uh, maybe I'm going back a bit. You we need see, to take a break, so just, just yeah. conclude on that for me. In, in conflict analysis, context is very, very important. So the idea here, and I think the politicians agree, that it is not a matter of whether they belong to NDC or whether they belong to NPP. That's not the idea. Now, their political affiliations is the context of kidnapping in this country. If you don't factor in political affiliation, and what is the significance of political affiliation? I've been told that there was one guy who was laughing all the time. So this, I can't say in the important Tiamwa. <laughs> a new one named uh, uh, I oh, yeah. Yeah. A criminal has been arrested. The criminal is all smiles. How can you read it? No, oh, I've got powers okay. behind me. You see, and there, there are precedents or precedences where people should have been brought to court or brought to book. They've been brought there and given a slap on the arm. So there are a number of things that we need to begin to tackle seriously. You know, uh, remove politicization as general and I think our political colleagues have said. And we'll begin to make, you know, an indent on, on the on the effort to combat the broad, you know, um, plethora of crimes. Very well. On that note we'll take a break. When we come back we'll wrap up on this conversation and look at the NDC chairman uh, Mr Samuel Opuswampofo's arrest this week. See you shortly. This is the key point. So welcome back. This is still the key point on TV3, also on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we just have about nine minutes to wrap up on the conversations here, but let me chip this in before we go back to the panelists. This is 3FM in partnership with Serenity Beach Resort, uh, organizing a live band music and cocktails as uh, we celebrate Father's Day. The venue is the Serenity Beach Resort. Time is 12 noon and the date is Sunday, 16 June 2019. That's tomorrow. It's time to celebrate the unsung heroes. Uh, the rate is 25 Ghana cities. That's plus drinks and it's free for children. So 
Make a day to go celebrate your dad's at the Serenity Beach Resort tomorrow, Sunday, the 16th of June, 2019. So, yes, we'll be wrapping up on the conversations here. I'll turn to um, Aja Parmesa here. Uh, the security issues wrapping up on that, the elements of foreign um, people and how we deal with it. Well, I guess the experts have spoken, you know, so to that extent, there's not much that I right. wish to add. Safe to say that, you know, even even the accoutrements that our security agencies need to enable them to carry out an efficient and effective, uh, 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 um, you know, or they are working efficiently. Right. In itself, it's problematic. You know, uh, Kennedy and I attended a, a workshop at the Ministry of Defense. And we're interested to know the kinds of things that our security agencies need. Of course, we as a country, we don't have all the resources to provide them, you know, what they need. And right. so issue of, <coughs> excuse me, prioritization came up. And of course, government is doing its bit. Uh, several vehicles have been provided to the Ghana Police Service. And, and I hope that in the coming years, you know, uh, much more will be done to ensure that we equip them fully to enable them carry out carry out their their work. Mm. But I do not have the sense of the heightened insecurity that our friends on the other side will make mm. than years to believe. Very well. well. Also, table for discussion today was the arrest of um, Mr. Samuel Ofo Sampofo, and you know all matters arising and the questions that have been asked. I just want us to wrap up on that with very limited time. So, Mr. Park, if you, Dr. Park, sorry, if you could start us off with that one. Well, very well. I, I think it's only fair that I also comment on the issue of foreign elements. <laughs> uh, and, and I say so because it, it, it factors into everything that mm. we are talking about. Uh, it is not just the case of the uh, kidnappings. We spoke about, uh, Kennel spoke about this uh, Bukinabis who, who came into the country. And then you also remember that I've always been very vocal on, on matters to do with protecting the environment. Sure. We know of the Chinese uh, lady Helen Huang, who, who was arrested w with uh, four containers of rosewood. And up to today, <laughs> after she was uh, granted bail, we cannot even find her. So the point I'm making is that she is even from a country where you are expected to come by air, to go through the processes at the airport. <laughs> and here she comes and engages in an act that is illegal Ghana. in Ghana. <laughs> and yet we cannot trace her. Exiting so how do we Ghana. then trace those who yeah, are even walking is. across our land borders? So we have a lot of work to do in the area of monitoring persons who come into Ghana, why they come into Ghana, whether when they come, they do what the mm -hmm. laws of Ghana has given them permission to come and engage in uh, in, in Ghana as well. So this is why I continue to say that the president must speak because it is becoming one too many right. and we need to be reassured that we are safe. It is not just sufficient that, that to say that we, we are safe. We, we run it on well, well. the time. Uh, if we want with to the speak issue to of the, our yes. party chairman, I mean, he, he has done what is expected, mm -hmm. uh, inviting somebody to come and assist the police in an investigation. It's not mandatory. They went on and they got Why are you a, a warrant. He's been arrested. They, they got a warrant. Um, Police has extended him. the courtesy. And he has done that. The reasons for which yeah. he was invited, <laughs> we continue to contest. <laughs> right. uh, and so <laughs> we will let the, the, the laws of the land take their, their course. Thank you very much. But we expect that there will be fairness. And there wouldn't be any indications of selective application of Very the law, well. which is a point that I kind of made that's, that I yeah. want to emphasize. That's fine. And I, and I come to you, Dr. Odruasai um, 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 here. Of course, I mean, there are those who are saying, well, this is a manifestation of, you know, the rule of law at work and all of that. But others are also, of course, the NDC up until they started cooperating, you know, with the police in this regard had raised issues about political persecution. Indeed, there was that grand, you know, press conference by the, is it the NEC, the National Executive Committee, where they had said all sorts of things. What do you make of that? There's not much I do about it. Yeah, I, I, you see, I think when it comes to issues of security, we should depoliticize it. Mm -hmm. We should take politics out of it. When the police invites you, you are obliged to go and then support them, give them the information they need. We all work with the police. There was an instance where the police invited me, had my land, somebody rather included, I had my title, everything. Somebody rather reported. Apparently, maybe the person knew somebody at the top there. They came in. And I went there. And as a lawyer, I have cooperated. Three months, they've not done anything about it. But I think that 
I have to cooperate. So anytime you are invited, it is not an arrest. And that's the problem I have with the media. Mm. The police will not arrest you. They are inviting you to come and support them. So you go there. Let us depoliticize it. And I can understand the tension that it created because it involved the chairman of an opposition political party. But let us send a signal to Ghanaians that all of us, irrespective of your political color, you have a role to play in supporting the security agency to fight, uh, to fight crime or anything and that is untold. Very country. well. Kenno, mm -hmm. any perspectives on this? No, I think on this issue you might, <laughs> wish, to, to <laughs> yeah, you might wish to excuse me. <laughs> Very well. I think um, General can talk to that. Yes, I'll, I'll come to you. Yes, I'll come to you. <laughs> Luckily, Kenno has defended to you know, the politician. So yes, quickly. Yeah, just quickly mm -hmm. All these people that are involved in the criminal thing you're talking about are young people. Mm. The devil finds job for the I idle hands. So please, please, let's think about the young people and do something about their problem. <laughs> With the arrest of the NDD chairman, I have no problem. If today, as I leave here, I'm accused of something, I should be arrested and I should obey the law. No one is above the law. About the law. Very well. Um, Major Pamesa. Thank you, General. You couldn't have put it more up. So then you have <laughs> yet, yet, yet. Of course, consistent with your nature. You went about saying all sorts Ooh, of things, bastardizing the security agencies. This is victimization, selective justice. Has it been committed? That was before. Now they are cooperating. So, so I that think. was the essence of the noise that they were making well. prior to his, his arrest. We're not making Very noise. Well. I think we're making we're making we can proceed to, to, end the, as a nation. to end our conversation. Yeah, so this is all we have for the Nobody show this morning. It's been exciting. We'd Nobody like to say thank you to viewers, listeners for making a date with us, sharing your messages with us. But also to say thank you to the panelists. We've had um, Kenel Festozabwaji, he's a security ec analyst, and Dr. Eric Odru Osai, a legal practitioner and a governance expert. We've had um, Brigadier General Nunu Mensa, he's a former chief of defense staff, Andrew Ejapat Mesa, MP for Secondary Constituency, also a legal practitioner, and Dr. Clementa Park, he's an MP for Bolsa South Constituency. Earlier on, we had Alex K. Chiduku Frimpong join us from the Political Science Department. Thank you so much. We'll be back here same time next week. Until then, do have yourselves a very, very good weekend and a productive week ahead of you. Bye-bye.